We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night question. Tonight's question comes from Nathan Beard, who writes, Hi Mo, love, love, love your site, style of writing, and expertise. Well, I'd love to see an article providing a guide or methodology for ki picking new Kickstarter games to back. Well, thanks so much for the question, Nathan. Uh, first off, I want to note that Nathan was also looking for a like a top list of the best games to come from Kickstarter which I think is a really solid topic and something we may want to talk about at some point, but it's a big enough topic to me to talk about on its own. So I've decided to save that question to potentially answer later. So if you're looking for that, maybe we'll have a link to that when it comes out later and we'll go back and edit this. So we'll point to it or something. Now, I also know that Nathan is looking for a blog article, right? Something to read. And I thought the first step though, before writing an article, and this is how I do all my articles, would be for Sean and I to sit down and discuss the topic first. For one, then you get both our opinions. Plus we'll see if we're on the same page as well as brainstorm ideas and tips where if I write it on my own, you're just gonna get my side of things. And I'm sure Sean will bring up something I didn't think of and he'll probably bring up something that um, will make me think of things in a totally different way. So here we are talking about it live here on Twitch. Now, the reason I chose this topic to talk about is because of our last Sunday brunch episode. Yeah, for those of you who may not know, most Sundays, Mo and I, and sometimes Deanna, go live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube and host an mm -hmm. unscripted show where we talk about all things geeky and gaming. Now, a part of that show usually ends up being talking about new game releases, but mm -hmm. also new crowdfunding projects and projects that are ending soon. Now, last week, we looked at a significantly large number of projects because we'd taken a few Sundays off and they kind of built up. So we looked at everything that basically launched in, um, not everything, sorry, anything that caught our eye that launched in May, as well as anything that was ending that weekend. And I don't know if it's true, but it sure felt like we looked at a lot of questionable projects, projects that seemed to have issues with them that made us kind of back off and think, I don't know. Like these weren't necessarily bad projects, but projects that left us with questions and that we had various concerns about. In fact, the more we do this, the more certain things start to mm -hmm. stick out as concerning trends that are to be watched out for when looking at projects. Now, in particular, I remember uh, saying the word red flags a lot and talking about red flags a lot during that show. And when I saw this question, um, again, going through, I've got an Excel file where I log everyone's questions they send and I'm going through, what should we talk about next? And I'm like, well, last week we did a, I, I'm going to say top 10. We don't do top 10, but we did a game recommendation list. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't like doing two game recommendation lists in a row. So I wanted something we can chit chat about. So I saw this chit chat episode and I'm like, wait, that's perfect. Like just this last weekend, we were talking about the various red flags. And I will say one thing right now. Please don't be worried. We are not going to call out any specific projects tonight. We are talking in general. So I don't want to scare anyone away. If you're a, you're a Kickstarter project you have out there, we're not specifically talking about you. So what we do on Sundays is we put together a list of projects that fit certain criteria, but that often doesn't involve actually looking at the project. This gives us a chance to look at them fresh without mm -hmm. preconceptions live on the show. Yeah, that's part of that show. Whereas if generally, if we talk about a Kickstarter here on our podcast, we already know about it. We want to highlight it because we're already interested or there's some other reason we want to highlight it. Whereas those, we tend to go in pretty much blind, except for the fact that there's buzz. And a lot of what I know about these projects is if other people are talking about them, then I'll at least have an idea of what people are excited about. Now, also, I don't want to be overly negative tonight. This is not a bash on Kickstarter projects night or crowdfunding. I keep saying crowdfunding. So that's the other thing. This is not just Kickstarter. This is crowdfunding. So every time I say Kickstarter, just change it in your head to crowdfunding. Uh, just like, you know, Kleenex and Rhesus. I don't say peanut butter cups because Kickstarter kind of did it first. So it sticks in my head as the brand. So I don't want to talk about just the negative. What scares us away? I also want to talk about what makes us want to back a project. And if there's anything that's basically an auto back for either of us. But let's start off with the negative and the warning signs. And as we, as Mo was just saying, uh, Nathan specifically mentions Kickstarter in their question, but none of what we're going to talk about is Kickstarter specific. All of this should apply equally to any crowdfunding platform, though I will point out that, for instance, some other sites display things very differently mm -hmm. than Kickstarter. 
which makes it harder or at least different to spot some of these red flags that we're going to be talking about. So let's start with those red flags. So again, red flag doesn't necessarily mean we're looking at a bad game or a bad project. These are just things that make us dive deeper. Something that's going to make me do research before picking a backer level. That said, they're kind of like strikes in baseball to me. If a single project has enough red flags, that's usually reason enough for at least me not to back. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and one of the first things that you see when you're backing a game or one of the first things that you look at when you're backing a game is who's involved, who is, who has created the project mm -hmm. that's right there, uh, up front. So and, what about them? Yeah. So the things I look for, for, for who, who created the project, right? So what's listed there is, is, is the person who the company is, or sometimes an individual person. And with that is a couple pieces of data with that. So I'm going to jump around a bit in our notes here and start by saying, if I've never heard of the person, to me, that's a red flag right away. Now that's very hard, right? Like I'm, I'm, there's going to be lots of people I've never heard of. But with how involved I am in the board game industry, seeing a completely new name is a bit of a rarity when we're talking about hobby board games. I'm looking for established companies, established publishers, established designers, established printing companies. I'm just looking for something familiar. And if I don't see any of that, it's a key to dig deeper. It's a, that, but then I'll do my research. It's the, I don't know who this is now, instead of looking and going, oh, well, it's Isaac Childress. I'm Right now, okay, I, I, they've delivered multiple projects. I got nothing to really worry about as far as who's running things. There might be other issues, but I can I can just go on. But then if I look it up and I see um, Max Gauthier, and I'm like, who the heck's Max Gauthier? I'll go on Board Game Geek and be like, okay, is, uh, do they have a designer entry? Oh, they do, and they have a website, and I'll do some diving. And I'll be like, oh, they have some chops. They've designed other games. They've done other work, and so on. So the first thing is that familiarity. Do I know the people involved? And right after that, because the first thing you see under their name is how they've been involved with projects. Yes. Uh, you know, have they have they made their own projects before? Have they have they been around on the site? Have they backed other projects? And if they have never done anything before, and almost especially if they've never backed anything before, mm -hmm. that's concerning because if you haven't been involved in the process on either side of the aisle you there that there there are problems i mean pick funding crowdfunding something is difficult it mm -hmm. is not an easy process so if you're starting completely from scratch how how did you get involved in this how much do you know and how much are you prepared for some of the the hiccups that could come your way yeah. as crowdfunding proceeds so yeah there's a we often and on our sunday shows or when we're looking at Kickstarter, again, crowdfunding, if we're looking at them, we'll often say, oh, zero created, zero backed. And, and like those two together are a red flag. Yeah. One of those is is like a, a pink flag. It's like, a, you know, might want to look a little more into it. But zero created, zero backed scares me. So, so one of them, I'm going to start with zero back. For me, like Sean said, it's familiarity, but it also shows that the person's part of the greater board game. I hate using the term industry, but it's what everyone uses. The, the, the the board hobby board game industry i can't think of or a better community. word off the top. community there you go hobby board game community right if you are backing you're supporting other people i want to see someone willing to support someone else who's like if you're looking for support i want to see that you've supported others in the industry i want to see what you and then i want to see who you supported so i want to see what you back so if you're I don't know, doing a deck building game. And I look and it looks like you backed all these Kickstarter deck builders and you're really involved in DC. I get a better idea of who you are and why you may be qualified to make this game you're trying to sell to me. And just knowing Kickstarter, using Kickstarter, using the platform, knowing things about the platform, all of that stuff, to me, scares me if you don't have any of that. Now, again, I get it if you haven't backed anything, but I would go so far, and we are going to have some tips thrown in here, is that if you are thinking of launching a Kickstarter, back something, like something, find, there's got to be something. If you're a gamer, you're going to find something on Kickstarter. Even if all you do is back 10, the top 10 projects on Kickstarter right now at a buck, to look at what they're doing so you can see what you should be doing. Yeah. Even that would qualify. Now, again, we are talking about red flags here and not dead things. So it, it is completely possible that 
you could have decided to create a business account and not use your personal account to start mm -hmm. your Kickstarter. So it is quite possible that it could be zero created, zero backed, even though the person behind that account sure. has backed hundreds of things. And that's one of those reasons why it's a flag and means you need to look deeper. You need to see Correct. who these people are. Maybe there's a perfectly acceptable reason why they've got a couple of zeros up there. And again, as a tip for someone who has a project, if you did just launch your company to launch a Kickstarter, say that and give us that background so I don't have to dig too. Yeah, give me a link to you know who you are so I can yeah. say, oh, well, of course. Perfect. That's just my new company. Yep. Great. All right. Zero created. First project. I know you got to start somewhere. I get it. Every person has a zero created project at least once, right? It's got to happen. Yep. I fully understand that, but it is a flag if it's a big, massive, epic thing. If your first created is a a prototype copy on a deck of cards that you used magic card creator to create and you really want this thing to exist and you can tell you're excited about it and you say zero created good on you because that's what kickstarter was created for yep and i will be possibly back that if the game looks interesting or if i know you and i just want to support you which we'll get to some of the green flags later now here's my tip though if you have something epic Find a way to kickstart a small part of it. Now, it's kind of hard to describe, but if you were going to put out, I'm trying to think of a good app, the Twilight Imperium, try to put out maybe a Twilight Imperium art book or a the, the, the history of Twilight Imperium or here's some sci-fi ships. I've seen this a couple of times. I've seen metal coins or miniatures for a game that doesn't exist yet, but people will still be interested in it. That way you get that one created under your belt and you prove that you can use the platform, you can deliver, you can interact with people. And again, we're not going to talk about all the things you should do to run a Kickstarter, but you can basically prove your worth on something smaller. And we see so many massive projects with tons of miniatures, with overproduced 10,000 cards, 3,000 hours of gameplay, zero created, zero backed. And I'm like, right away, I'm... Like, I, I, how do I know you're going to manage all of this? I'm much more likely to manage the person who's come up with board game tape, and it's something that you can use to tape your games together that's not going to leave sticky stuff behind. Yeah. It, there's a, and there's, a, there's another sort of a, a key joint. So if you've got zero backed, the, the amount of money you're asking for becomes something to immediately look at. So if, you, mm -hmm. if you've never backed anything and you're asking for... A couple of thousand dollars okay that's a re that's reasonable that's a, this is a small project and maybe mm -hmm. you're going to make it big but if you're starting your first ever project and you don't appear to have any other projects behind you in other ways and you're asking for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that's a huge red flag for me yeah. this is that's terrifying for me because that is a lot of money to have responsibility for <laughs> and then again red flag this is going to make me dig if I see that, I better be able to scroll down your project and see some form of pie chart or something that is showing me why you need all that money and what it's for and who's getting what. Show me that you've actually done a budget, not just went $300,000. I could use that. Yep. Or, 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 you know, you got, your, you, got the, you got one quote for how much your board game is going to cost to produce. And you said, oh, well, I'm going to sell 10,000 of those. 10,000 times that number. Boom. There you go. That's my, yep. that's how much money I need. I've seen it. Oh yeah. No, it's, I've definitely seen it. <laughs> there's a now, reason why this up, is a red flag. <laughs> yes. Now, since you brought it up, I also have concerns with the exact opposite. People who put a funding goal that's so easy to hit. It's like, I, I, they did it just so it's can fund and they can make the thing and they get some money is what it feels like. If you put it too low, it feels like, like here I am just going to do it. And now, sometimes I see this when the game's already produced, which is another red flag, which we'll talk about in a second. I don't know about a red flag, but it's something worth discussing. Um, but seeing a backer level that's ridiculously low. And where we're seeing this a lot recently is a relaunch. So someone will launch a Kickstarter and want $100,000, and they don't even get close. And then they relaunch with an $800 goal. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what happened to the 100000 you needed a month ago? How is it 800 now? Yeah, and unfortunately, I think one of the major driving factors behind these lower levels 
is backer kit or its various I, I i don't want to call it backer kit specifically but any of the backer systems mm-hmm. uh that are that are essentially pre-order systems so a lot of projects are almost encouraging people to go in as low as possible in order to yep. make up all that money on the back end with add-ons and customizing customizing your orders uh and that's problematic in a number of ways um but it also makes it more difficult to see that low number as a red flag you need to again something to look at you know are they pushing towards a backer kit where that money is going to come in yeah, they're, they're just using kickstarter for the hype at that point which acceptable uses of kickstarter is probably a whole other topic <laughs> but i will admit for us they can be red flags like one of the questions i will ask myself is should this be on Kickstarter? Why is this person using Kickstarter? And I will fully admit that they are trying to get in the buzz and they're trying to use it as a uh, pre-order system is a legit use for Kickstarter now, what most people do. But there are a lot of stuff that's like crafty, homemade stuff that I honestly think better fits on Etsy. And I totally do not understand why people are even allowed to sell STL files on Kickstarter. I don't get it. Because like the work's done, you have a finished project. You're just selling files. Again, that really belongs on Drive Through RPG or Thingverse or something like that, and not Kickstarter. Now, if you're going to tell me I'm going to hire a 3D artist to make these, but then that would never get funded. So, because you need your mockups to even be able to get it. So, and and I will admit, I personally have had bad experience with miniature heavy Kickstarters. Yeah, it's I, and this is one of those things where again, we, you know. It's a different topic, but uh, I have personally complained to Kickstarter because there have been projects which say we have it. It's in our warehouse, yeah, buy which it. is buy it on Kickstarter and Kickstarter has allowed them to continue. So the, the yeah. platform is evolving. Um, and, uh, you know, again, those are red flags, though. If, if I see yeah. something that at one point broke the rules even if the rules have evolved if it was so it's still the, the rules, rules as written right now yeah, yeah, that's okay. there is that but and if i see something that it that is pushing against the rules of of, of the crowdfunding pro, uh, platform you really kind of have asked to ask why maybe it's cool maybe they are testing the waters and and you know there's a paradigm shift and they're doing something new and that's great or maybe they're just using the platform because it gets a lot of people all right, what did I want to, we we, we kind of went out of order from our notes and I'm like, not even sure what to talk about next. All right, you know what, let's get, since we're talking about money, let's move on to backer levels. One of the things, uh, Sean does this quicker than I do. I, I tend to scroll through the platform where Sean does jump to the backer levels right away when we're reviewing these. And I don't know if that's just a division of work that kind of <laughs> happened over time or not, but backer levels can be huge. Like they have to make sense. Absolutely. And not only that, I will look at how many people are in on a backer level. So if you've got something that already has red flags and there are some, you know, strange backer levels that are really, really high levels. So if you've got like something that is be, that a backer level that is a percentage, a notable percentage of your total, and that's funded by multiple people for something that already has a bunch of red flags, um, you could very well be, you know, scamming the system. I mean, I'm not going to go so far as saying, you know, money laundering or anything like that. But if you're bringing your friends in yeah, to, to, I, to I make tend to, sure I tend to see those funding. as friends and family pledges. So, you, are, you are getting people who are investing right. in your project instead of... Right. So you're bringing in these investors at the very high levels, which pushes you over your funding level without actually... Show enough any number of people showing that they really support you um mm-hmm. and and so that's a huge thing and then your next problem and this is something we see with really established projects i mean something that that doesn't have a lot of red flags otherwise will have this vastly confusing number of backer levels um uh, the perfect example no you know what we're not gonna no, call don't call any, any no, we're not don't calling call any any specific but there's there's wanna... one that there's there are some where it's, you need to spend ages trying to figure out how to get what you want yes and i have come into a couple of occasions uh, on projects that i wanted to back where i stopped because i could not buy the products 
I, you know, picked just In the, the combo comics you wanted. I wanted. The, the, the combo I wanted did not exist. Um, and I ended up waiting and I didn't go in and I, you know, eventually there was a, a, a backer kit level I could, I could go in and pre-order, but that was, you know, that wasn't clear at the time. So I didn't just back at the $1 level and I just went in later when they opened up pre-orders afterwards. So if you, you can certainly be hurting yourself if you aren't offering the product to people that they want. Now, my biggest scare with backer levels that will be such a big red flag, I just won't back you, is if your math doesn't make sense where you offer whatever at this level, or you can get six copies at this level, or you can do this other thing with this t-shirt and these two free add-ons, or you can get just the add-ons. And it actually works out that the game's cheapest if I just buy the individual. And if I buy six, I'm actually paying $6 more. And I'm like, if you can't handle the math of a bulk order discount, I don't trust you to handle the math of shipping it to me or logistics or production or any of that. Now, I don't see this often, but it does come up. And sometimes that they, they make no sense. Like, here's all these $10 add-ons. I, I, there is something, I don't want to, uh, hey, there is a project. I, I wasn't even trying to think of a single. I just, I realized by saying if I backed it, people could technically look and see what I backed. So I don't even want to say I backed it. So there are, there are, there are projects out there who have a bunch of add-ons where in the end, it was cheaper to order all the add-ons than to back for the uh, the all-in. And I've seen that multiple times. Yep. And I'm like, so wait, wait, how is this? Like, the math doesn't work. And there were some big ones recently that had that problem. Yeah, it, it's, it's strange. And I mean, I'm sure they have some justification for it. Um, but what it ends up looking like is trickery. You know, it looks like yeah. they're trying to scam people. Um, and if like, you're yeah, trying get to get the all in, if you're trying to 29 or two for 60, yeah, if you're trying to scam people, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah. No, that one worries me a lot. Um, jumping back. I, I know this is the, I've had coffee and stuff and we do have some questions for the chat. I'd like to bring up before we go to the lobby or we'll keep the lobby in, um, canceled projects. I admit, I hate the last minute cancellation, especially if you're funded. I get that's kind of what people do now because their funding goals aren't realistic anymore. It used to be that you've set your funding goal to what you needed to make the game and get it to backers. To me, that makes sense. And it's what I wish people did, but I get that the platform is involved and it's all about initial day spikes and getting funded early because people tend to back already funded projects more than not back. But I hate seeing the you're already funded and you cancel. Now that the way it's canceled, so it's not a red flag, but one of the things I will look at is how many times have you canceled this product before? If it's one, I'm going to look and see what the differences are. What'd you fix? If it's two or more, I'll probably stop digging at that point. To me, that's enough flags. And I'm like, okay, why, why? All right. You already failed twice. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give you that third shot. You, everyone else has already waved the red flags behind this. Why, why is it, uh, you know, why is it still existing if everyone has told you to go away? <laughs> yeah. 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 So again, if, there, and, and then if I look and it was like canceled, but it was funded, why, why did you, what, what didn't you, what'd you lie to us about? Right? Like what, what funding goal was wrong? Like if you tell me it's cause shipping's gone up 200% in the last two years, I'm like, okay, yep. legit. Again, red flag makes me dig. If the dig is, oh, wow, we totally did not charge enough for shipping. So we had to relaunch. Right there with you. I fully understand right now. One of, the, one of the things I'll say, and we keep talking about digging, is one of the red flags, if we are digging back, you know, if we see these canceled projects, uh, when I see those canceled projects, I almost immediately jump in to the discussions, into the actual comments yes. in there. And a lot of times it's something simple. It's, you know, hey, uh, we can't do this because of shipping or you know, everyone has pointed out a real problem in our rule book and we need mm -hmm. to straighten this out. So we're going to cancel. Yeah, the look, game's broken. I've yeah, seen that there's, before. There's a number of things where if you just come out and say, look, there is a problem and we are canceling because of this. And you put it out there in your comments to your backers or comments, to, you know, public comments, then that's there for people to see. And uh, all of a sudden a red flag goes away. You know, all of yeah. a sudden it's like, oh, that's why. Great. No problem yep. at all. Now that leads me to one that I didn't even think of when working on the notes for tonight that does scare me is uh private. Everything's private. I can't see it. What are you trying to hide? Yeah. Like seriously, are you one of those people who thinks that someone's going to steal your board game design? 
Like, 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 I, I don't know, unless you're talking about people's address or your percentage of backers from certain countries, I don't see what you should, like, I honestly think that all comments should almost be public on every Kickstarter. I realize there might be reasons not to, but in general, keep those big updates open for people, especially if you're then going to go on and do a backer kit or, or a late pledge. I hate when they're like, all right, we've opened up late pledges for this. And I'm like, oh, okay. I looked at this when it came out and it wasn't enough to catch my interest. Let's see what's available now. And I can't see all the updates. Yep. So I'm like, well, I need to be able to see the updates to see if I want a late pledge. Absolutely. Keeping uh, people informed. And that goes not just for the people who have spent money because the people, people who are haven't interested. spent money. Yeah. People who haven't spent money are still a potential income source. So don't lock mm -hmm. them out. Now, since we're talking about updates, we want updates. Yes. Give us clear communication. Give us FAQs. Lack of any of that, especially, here's a huge red flag. If I go into the comments and they're public and I see lots of people asking questions and no one replying, that's big. Yeah. If you are not paying attention to the backers you already have and what they're asking, that is a big red flag for me. Yeah, regular discussions. Now, I recently backed a project that was fantastic. Uh, I wish everyone could learn from this project because it was a daily fest of communications. It was, I, it was I, honestly, lot. it was amazing. I had never had a better communication project from any project I have backed ever. And I don't expect that all the time. This was an exception. But there are also projects I've backed where six months go by without communication. Uh, and that's where everyone starts getting really antsy. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, did, why did I give this person my money if they aren't going to yeah, tell that, me anything? Like, um, well, that's legit. That has no basis on whether you backed or not. No, but again, the on the uh, in the in the communication levels of all the different communication, if people are asking questions and they aren't responding, yes, that's you know, it's a huge thing. And you know, hey, maybe maybe they only respond once every couple of days, but you can see. Oh, look, mm. they went through and they did a bulk bunch you of responses. You better have someone responding days. on day one. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, they, like For me, that's a red flag. A big, if yeah. you're not responding to the initial influx of people with questions, like, again, red flag. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know what your reason is. No, I can't. Be. There's no reason. I can't think of a good reason. Day, day two, like, uh, maybe. Uh, I'm a single person <laughs> launching my, again, my, my, my passion project card game. Yes, maybe. You're overwhelmed. But if like if it's any company that has more than one employee, um, or if you're launching anything that's going to raise, you know, let's say over fifty thousand dollars, that day you hire someone to answer your questions or yep. to do something, whatever you normally do, so you can answer questions, whatever it may be. And and don't just answer backer questions. Uh, I there was a project I was considering backing, but I didn't end up backing, and I reached out to them because there were some details on their project that weren't clear. I wanted more information to decide whether or not I was going to back mm -hmm. them. And I asked them and they responded. It was great. They, I said, hey, do you have this particular uh, technical information? And they said, no, we don't. Hold on. They got back to me a, a few days later and gave me the information I, I had requested. It was fantastic. Uh, and it turns out they couldn't get me the information, the, the next set of information I asked for, and I mm -hmm. didn't back them, but they were communicating with me. Uh, and that was that was fantastic. That was a, that was a nice touch to be able to reach out to someone and get that back and forth, even though I hadn't given them money yet. Yeah. So I'm going to jump over to a couple of things the chat room saying, because I think they kind of fit in here. Uh, so one of them thoughts on the strategy of upping the amount for the pledge in after the project ends. Again, we're talking about do we back or don't we back? Not Kickstarter best practices or things they should or shouldn't do. So I'm going to skip that for now. But no, that seems terrible to me. But that, that's not something I'm going to know ahead of time. Um, but one of them, stretch goals. Do we like stretch goals or not? I, I think they're inevitable, but I also appreciate a project when I open it up and they don't have any and are like, here's my thing. I'm going to give you this thing. You pay me, I give you the thing. I love seeing that nowadays because the stretch goals can get ridiculous. Now, where I the red flags come in is when there's so many that I can't figure out what's what and they overlap and they cross and you can get this package and it kind of goes to all those different backer levels. Well, the same thing for stretch goals and add-ons. And then, I don't know, some, I don't have as much a problem with it that other people do. I know people absolutely hate them. Like I am currently tracking a project that every day is telling me more stuff they're getting. And I'm like, the old concept of stretch goals was like, we're doing better than we thought. So here's some additional stuff that's gone. 
these are fully planned out. I, I'd be surprised. Like, like there's going to be a few people out there, indie publishers who like suddenly have a hit on their hand and are like, oh, wow, we need stretch goals. But in general, that's all part of the project. And you'll see it because the project will fund and then they'll throw all the rest that they didn't get to for free as if it's a bonus. But that was all there in the first place. Yeah. But to me, that's not a flag either way. Like, like unless it's overly confusing, right? If there's too much. Yeah. One of the things I try to look for is stretch goals should be something that the backers get. Yes. Stretch goals that are add-ons is often a frustrating thing. And that's something that a lot of the big mini the big ones, the, yeah. the, the giant, you know, boxo minis plus boards uh things that I'm not gonna back anyway generally are 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 doing is it's not you you get a couple of things but then after a while it just starts to be here we've unlocked more things you can buy and yes. for me that personally that's a red flag but again i'm not the market for those <laughs> there are people all. who love those though and yes. sharing off their stacks of games it's, absolutely yeah um so to go with that what the heck was i gonna say sorry i, I total <laughs> gone um stretch goals uh i don't want to name projects big piles of minis oh my biggest thing with stretch goals is don't sell me an incomplete game that's the red flag when here's the core game which is this little piece of garbage but when you throw all these stretch goals on it it becomes awesome right and of course you won't back at the basic level the basic level is just there for dupes like don't do that Right. Give me a legit game and make the stretch goals useful things to add to that game. I really, I, I've seen it now where it's like, like the, the, the wording of the text, everything is almost like you got to be an idiot to back at the basic level. And I find that insulting. And I'm like, and also if that's the case, don't produce it. It's, it's the GTFM from role-playing. Like, like, just give me the thing. Yeah. Don't do all this preamble marketing BS. Just give me the thing you wanted to sell me. And and Roger Rogers brought it up in the chat room where he I don't trust projects which give critical game components to yes. backers only or specific backers only. Either way, you know if, mm -hmm. if, if the game is the game and whether it's you know the the game should be the same whether you buy it on the shelf two years later when it comes out in retail or you buy it. Maybe your components are different, but mm -hmm. the game is still the game. Um, yes. And that's and that's one of those hard things to, to that, that to one's rough. With. And, and again, it doesn't really fall into flags for me, but it is something I look at. I want kicks uh, like stretch goals to improve the game. I appreciate it when it improves it for everyone. I love those stretch goals. Like everyone gets another mission. Everyone gets a fourth character. And I personally think Kickstarter exclusive should not produce new content. Right. Like 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 a new character in an adventure game is fine. Maybe a side quest, but like, don't give them a whole new dungeon. Don't give them a whole new monster type. Don't give them a whole new book. Like it, it, it comes with a starter adventure for an RPG. I don't know. I'm coming up with stuff off the top of my head and without trying to, again, think of right. specific. Quality, physical quality improvements yes. uh, in Kickstarter are one thing. You know, yeah. I'm going to bling Give me out box inserts. Give me yeah. better components. Let me bling out my game on Kickstarter. But the game that I'm, the actual game is still the same if yes. buddy buys it at retail two years later uh i'm just paying and, for all the extra cool sh cool stuff <laughs> the other thing too is i don't mind them if you sell me the stretch goals separate so i can back again i'm not trying to mention names i can get the base game and if you back the kickstarter you also get the expansions but everyone else can also get the expansions they just got to pay separate yep. totally cool with that yeah yeah absolutely and uh but and, and if and if you don't offer the bling later that's fine yeah. It's That's just, fine. but the content, the actual mechanical content of the game should be out there for everyone yes. because I don't want to be able to say, oh yeah, I played Gloomhaven and completely random here. This is, I played Gloomhaven and John's never played Gloomhaven. I've never played Gloomhaven. And, and uh, your buddy over there is like, well, I played Gloomhaven, but it was nothing like that game. Yes. And and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. If if two people are playing a game, they should be playing the same game. They should be yes. able to talk about their experiences playing the game. And when there's completely different content, you lose that. All right, moving on to other red flags. I do not like <laughs> this fits with what we're talking about, stretch goals, add-ons, backer levels, swag that is not part of the game. 
I this is one of the ones that I, I remember Sean when we were first talking Kickstarter. He's like, why not? And I'm like, no, this is yeah. terrible. I have seen too many projects fail for offering stuff like t-shirts, jackets, hats, plushies, super large cloth maps, um, UV coated posters, all stuff that's just swag. Swag is terrible. Swag is large and it takes up bigger packages and it increases your shipping. Stuff can get more easily damaged. If you're going to send an art print, you need to pack that completely differently than if you send something else. Like throw in a postcard in the box is okay, but don't sell me a Gloomhaven, you know, bomber jacket to wear. Yeah, and it, this this depends on a lot of different things. So uh, one of the things I've backed a lot is comic books. I've backed a number of superhero comic books. And one thing they tend to do is throw stickers in or trading cards in. But you're shipping a comic book and that you're keep that you're fighting to keep as flat as possible anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't add anything to shipping, and that's fine. But as soon as you see a t-shirt or buttons, mm -hmm. um, those take up space and they change your packing and they add weight to shipping and they don't add anything to the product. And they add another source to your thing. You now have a different production company because Steve Jackson Games isn't going to print your T-shirts. You're now dealing with T-Bubby or whatever or some other company to try to get that stuff there to ship. So while your board game producer may get you your thing and the rule book producer may get you your thing, you don't want to hold up the game because the hats haven't come in yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of problems when you start diversifying your deliverables. Yes. Um, the more SKUs you have to deliver, the more problems exactly. you're getting into and the harder it is. And, you know, maybe you're a major company that deals with this sort of thing all the time. But even, even then, then, even then, you don't necessarily want to have to deal with it. Um, you know, but if, again, if, but if you're not a major company, if you're not, you know, a huge company that is already dealing with a number of, a large number of SKUs, if you're just a guy starting off or a small company with three games, please don't add more stuff yeah. just because you think it's cool and you think it's going to add, you know, ramp up the numbers, ramp like, up the numbers for your game. Have, have a merch store on your website and link sure. to it. Like Absolutely. if people want your merch, let them buy your merch. That's fine. I'm not trying to say don't have merch, but don't throw it in as part of your Kickstarter. And again, maybe this is a personal opinion. Um, we've got some people in the chat saying they don't mind it that much, but like I know projects who failed because of this. That, 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 well, not necessarily failed. Like people got their stuff, but like the people sending it went out of business because they couldn't afford it. And it wasn't the game that killed them. It was the t-shirts. And yep. in one case, it was jackets, right? Yep. I, I Like honestly, like to me, that's perfect. Like sell me your merch. That's perfectly fine. Heck, we are currently talking to someone in Ottawa to start producing Canadian merch for us. We're probably like, unless we do a Kickstarter for our podcast and that is the physical reward, I don't think we're going to be offering merch with, you know, Moe's D20 game he finally <laughs> writes and sells. Just not a thing. Yep. All right. Minor red flag for me. This is the best game ever. This was designed by gamers for gamers. A totally unique take on deck building, marketing keywords. A good game doesn't need buzzwords. And the more you use, the more I think you're trying to hide the fact and get me excited about a game that isn't at all exciting. Now, I worked in marketing. Maybe that's what it is. But that scares me away. I have seen a large number of projects that are generally by people outside of yes. the industry. They are um, wizards there's, at, there's games they're wizards at marketing. About. Yeah, they're, they're wizards at marketing. Uh, and and they, they've got a whole lot of clout from outside of the board game industry. Yes. And they had a great idea and they turn into the pitch man, the person on Shark Tank who mm -hmm. is trying to, you know, sell something that they've got regardless of the quality. And maybe it's great quality, maybe it's not. But if you have to push those words and the buzzwords and the, 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 the sound, you know, put too much effort into selling your project, why are you putting that much effort into selling a project? Yeah. It's it's something in life, door to door salesman. I will never buy from because if you have to come to my door to make me want your product, <laughs> I clearly don't need it enough. And it's the it same with buzzwords. <laughs> it's the same with buzzwords. If you have to work that hard to sell yeah. me your project, your your product, I probably don't want it. 
And I got to admit, if you throw in a million tech magazines as in they supported by and liked by and reviewed by, again, you kind of scare me away. Why do you need that much hype to sell me your game? Just sell me a good game. And a lot of that, I mean, generally, I will have noticed that way back at the beginning when we're looking at, when we're doing our backer research, like who the person, yes. uh, who the producer is, you'll see this person and you go, oh, they, you know, write for blah, blah, this. blah from ZDNet, you know, right, exactly. And it's, you know, they just called in all their buddies and hey, you know, all, all the people who I do reviews for all the companies I work for are going to throw their logos on here because we're all cool buds. Great. Yeah. And that's awesome. But that doesn't in any way like make it a good red game. flag. <laughs> I, some uh, exploding kittens there. I'm calling out a specific game. Damn. Exploding kittens wouldn't exist. Right. Without that. And it's uh, not my favorite game, but it's a solid game and lots of people enjoy it. And it went mass market, which awesome. Good job, Oatmeal. Um, but there you had someone who writes comics who got a bunch of big names to support them to get the word out in the marketing. But it's a red flag. It's, it's Again, it's maybe the best game. By gamers for gamers, I, I hate that term all the time. That That is an instant turnoff for me. I'm like, just because you play, like, like, like who's going to claim otherwise? What I What I see a lot of the time is is you'll see this you know the totally unique uh way of doing this the the first time this has ever existed in a deck builder and they've got zero they've they've never built a game before their biography says that they've been working on this game for eight years that's actually another flag (laughs) it's it's you know okay you have put your heart and soul into this but you've not done any market research you know if you're using if you haven't gone to board game geek and googled your game name yeah, no, absolutely. It's there, there's a, there's some definite red flags when you start using these fancy terms because yeah. most of the time it means you haven't done your research. Yeah, you're just using you're doing SEO and not actually selling me a game. Another one. This isn't a red flag. This is a please, please, please tell me about the game. Don't make me scroll to the bottom seventy five percent of your Kickstarter before you tell me what it's about. And this that, is that, and this is getting worse. It is. This is getting a lot worse. You're getting so much stuff up top now what i think a lot of these designers are doing is putting it all into the top video well guess what maybe i'm different but i'm not looking at your video if i have gotten far enough into your project and i'm really really interested i will probably look at your video but odds are good that i just want to scroll down your project i don't want to sit through Mm -hmm. your marketing pitch i don't want you to sell to me actively through a video i want to scroll down real quickly and see and so if you're hiding all the actual game content in a video, you've probably lost me and you probably won't get me as a salesperson. Yeah. Now, what I think happens, and I don't know this for sure, but what I, I have a feeling happens with most of these projects is if you went day one, it would tell you about the game. But then they keep updating it so that the what they're trying to do now is here's our stretch goals. Here's my new thing. Here's what you're going to get now. Here's our hundred new things. Here's our new mini sculpts. And I think people keep throwing them at the top. And I think they often, like I, we spent how long looking at a specific project and we could not figure out if it was a cooperative or competitive game. We had to go to board game geek and check the side categories to find out what kind of game it is. I'm not going to back your game. If I don't know what your game's about. Yeah. If I, if, if I actually get to the point of hitting control F and searching for keywords to try and figure something out, you have got a problem on yes. your site. <laughs> and I get concerned that even if it is a good game, that like, can you write a rule book? You can't write a Kickstarter page. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and there's there's a lot of a lot about page layout that's very different. And this is one of the ones that is hugely different between oh, yes. sites. Huge. This is this is a big problem, actually on some sites because some sites are deliberately um i hate to say hiding but really hiding information um from people who visit this site uh who are like mo and i just want to roll roam around and look for information uh and it, it's kind of hidden in strange ways so right up front get out there and i'm not asking you necessarily to post your rules Although if you do, I'm probably oh, going to read them. The, the, I'm probably going to read that them. That goes down here. <laughs> when um, we get to green flags, or we'll just mention now, post your rules, please. Yeah. I, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about that one because I do see some of the giving away too much information. You know, you don't want to give away what you're selling, everything that you're selling. 
But at the same time, you know, especially, you know, in a if it's a mini game, no one's buying it for the rules. So yep. if your rules aren't there for someone to look at and figure out whether or not it's a good game, that's a big thing. But yep. there are other games where I can sort of understand, you know, especially if you've got virtual tabletops or whatever ways to play the game, not just mm -hmm. throwing the whole rule book up. Yeah, I got the, the, the again that goes into the greens. That's not yeah, a red we're, flag. We're, we're right shifting here, sort of. We're, we're shifting a bit, but I do have a couple I want to bring yep. up uh, before we get there. There was something, and I forget what it was. So shipping, I I don't even know what to tell you nowadays, but it better be reasonable. And the red flag nowadays is when it's too low. It's not when shipping's too high. It's when it's too low that I'm like, whoa, well, how or, do you think you're going to ship me this or a for lack 30 of, bucks? Or a lack of information about shipping. At all. If they yes. haven't, if they clearly haven't done the work to figure out ballpark what their shipping is going to be, even if they just, because if they just say, we'll figure out shipping later, mm, hold on. Wait, I, if you haven't done the work to give me an idea, why, you know, what else haven't you done the work for? Though I fully get people doing that right now because they have no idea. Well, yeah, yeah, but there's you can have no idea and say right now, you know, today this is what today the shipping, shipping is, would cost. But us we this. aren't going to shop, but we aren't going to charge until the project mm -hmm. ships. There's got to be something there that shows that you have done some level of due diligence on yes. shipping because shipping is a, you know, the core Massive portion, the, the the core aspect of deliverables. You know, you're mm -hmm. delivering by shipping. So yes. show me that you've thought about it. Yeah, and unless the you know the person making the Kickstarter lives down the street, <laughs> it's got to get shipped. Got to get shipped. Yeah. So, and again, this is going back to more money things. Is your funding amount? So, does your project scale? Well, we talked about this a little bit already, and and you know whether or not you know what what you're starting with. Hey, you know it's your first project, and why are you starting at three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars? But the actual of financial amount funded. So. If it is a $700 funding amount, a small little, you know, maybe this should have been on Etsy project that only asked for $700, but suddenly has $300,000. How sure are you that this person is going to be able mm -hmm. to scale up to that level? Yes. Um, you know, scaling is huge. There are a large number of projects out there that have become wildly uh, successful and collapsed under the yes. weight of their success. Which often the problem is that whole thing we're talking about stretch goal creep is they start thinking they need to offer more. Yeah. We have this much. I need to reward. Oh my God, we're doing so well. I need to offer more. And I wish more back creators were like, wow, I'm just getting way more money than I thought I would for this thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's where they get buried is the scale. Now in general, it should mean you're making more money because you should be able to produce whatever it is you're producing at a larger scale and get a better price, which is definitely a huge thing. I went talking board games and role-playing game. When you're, when you're talking cardboard and paper, bulk is huge. If yeah. you can switch from doing a 1,000 print run to a 5,000 print run, that's massive. And if you can go from 5,000 to 10,000, that's massive. But and I think the actual, from what I've heard, it's actually like 1,000 to 3,000 is, is more the big jumps, but Right. But at the same time, if you've got, you know, all sorts of extras you're offering and, you know, the T-shirts and all the other things, all yes. the other red flags that we've already been talking about. And these numbers are just going far beyond clearly what you had expected. You have to pause before you. Oh, and a lot of people think, oh, look, it's funded. That's great. That's perfectly safe. Well, hold on. Mm -hmm. There is too such a thing as too much of a good thing. Oh, well, yeah. Once you get into that size, you got to warehouse the stuff. Yeah. If I'm expecting to ship a board game out of my house and sell a hundred copies and suddenly I get 3000 copy orders, where do those games go yeah. right now? I'm having to pay for a U store or get a thing in my yard, or I got to contact, like, I don't even know, yeah. you know what, what you do at that point, And that's not free. And you pay for every day stuff is sitting there and so on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's just one of those things you need to, uh, you need to pay attention because you, the, the goal is to get to the end line and get all this product yes. out to the clients yes. and and hopefully make some money and you don't go out of business doing it absolutely one of the stretch goals i really enjoy and i i really only see this happening at rpgs for the most part pay people is more pay people more right yeah. that's you know pay people more that's a perfectly acceptable stretch goal 
Um, I don't think I've ever seen that on a board game product. No. Well, I mean, hopefully that means people are getting paid properly in the board game world in the first place, but I, I doubt it. Um, <laughs> let's be honest here. Uh, artists are rarely getting paid their true value uh, in any industry. Our artists, editors, Editor, writers. Yeah. <laughs> Not just artists. Well, I mean, editors and uh, writers are uh, writers. I clump in with artists in most of these these times but yeah when you get into you know the rule book creators and the solo game players and all these other people play testers you know, play them pay them more and 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 don't you know maybe don't add that extra giant miniature that doesn't really add anything to the game or that uv coating yeah absolutely think about the environment That's folks uv coating just makes your cardboard unrecyclable who recycles their games <laughs> no one's going to recycle the game all right this took longer than i thought it would which is awesome in a way it's a good chat and we got some good stuff in the chat room we'll get to in a bit uh some some green flags i'm, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick um <laughs> i don't know why like I, I hate being on the side of the bad but i think that was the more useful segment of the show the more useful information um so the biggest one have you done it before had like if you've already had a massive kickstarter and you delivered it and i got my copy of the game and the game was awesome and i didn't see any editing issues and i had fun playing it and now you've got a new one and the game looks just as good and you're using an established person and that one's already sold and then you're going to do it again if you previously sent people stuff and they're happy with what they got and i can especially see a track record like once you're getting up to three four times i'm gonna trust you a lot more it's it's gonna eliminate a lot of those red flags and i'll be like i i um, eh, again i'm not gonna mention companies <laughs> there are certain people i would have no qualms about backing and i wouldn't I, like i it just look at the game and go wow that looks cool i'm interested in that i'm gonna back like done yep absolutely there, there are there are a hundred percent projects where i have you know not even gone through half the red flag checking because of who and what was being presented yeah I said, especially with the previously preview. Now, if they don't, if it's someone established, if it's an established, I'm going to use the term brand. If it's an established brand and established publisher, I, I'm going to trust them more because they can already produce games and ship them around the world. And I can buy their game at my local game store. So I know they understand the distribution channel and they obviously are paying people to produce games already. That is going to, again, it's a green flag. It's a, oh, it's by them. I know them. Yep, absolutely. It makes, it just greases the wheels that much more for it to enable them to get our, you know, to get our money. It's, yeah, yeah, sure. I feel confident in them. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the giant name brands. No, not This could be a brand, you know, of someone you know on Twitter who you've seen go through some of this stuff before. You know, it's, it's. Yep. Joe from Twitter who delivered, you know, four RPGs last year. Great. Or, you know, you've, you've seen and bought a bunch of their stuff on drive through RPG and they're putting out something new. Yes. Um, it doesn't have to be that big, you know, the big brands. Well, also we say big, even the big brands aren't that big. Like unless we're talking Hasbro. Yeah. There's only Asmodee. one big brand and even, Has there's even two. Asmodee isn't as big as Hasbro. No, they're bigger uh, actually because it's a French conglomerate that owns more than just game industry stuff. Yeah. They're 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 huge. Um, yeah, I, like we're talking big, but like like Grand Gamers Guild is is Mark Spector, <laughs> like and Stronghold Games for years was Stephen Bonacor, and they have lots of great games. So just as an example, uh, next is designers. You throw up a Stefan Feld Kickstarter. I'm gonna be tempted to ignore red flags because I want to see the new Stefan Feld game. <laughs> um same with rpg designers you see I, i'll admit i'm not a huge monty cook fan but that was the first name that came to mind robin laws throw up a robin laws game i'm gonna dig deeper as a green flag like oh what's robin doing now i dig robin's style of narrative gaming and his unique approach to mechanics um i have a robin laws game back there that i've kickstarted <laughs> and there's a monty cook one which is why i mentioned those two because they're literally behind me so if you got a well-known designer that's obviously going to be a green flag for me um, same with board games. Uh, like you throw out the, the right names, and there are people who have published a ton of games. You throw out, you know, the bigger names like Anton Bowser or whatever. I got a T-shirt full of them. I'm not wearing it today. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's you know, and again, once you move on from designers, uh, more things we talked about. Again, that as much as it's a red flag to not be there, good communication is the green flag, right? Mm -hmm. If you flip, if I flip over to that communication tab, and I can immediately see 
that they're interacting with people and telling and things. interacting well, not yeah. just attacking yeah, yeah. their backers. Uh, if if there's an FAQ, uh, yep. even if it even if there's just a couple of entries, if there's an FA, I, I've seen a lot of things where there's no FAQ, and I'm like, I don't believe there's no questions about this, not at all. There's no project you're going to put out there that doesn't have questions. So if you've got a couple of questions on your FAQ, um, that's you know great to see and updates. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's if it's not day one, if it's not still within the first you know six hours, there should be updates. Mm -hmm. So, all right, another one. Lots of friends backing. Yeah. If you have a Kickstarter account, I'm sure you have your notifications on, and you get told when your friends back. And that's our friends, <laughs> not the creators' friends specifically. Yes, yes. <laughs> creators' friends backing could be a red flag. Um, not that you always see them. But like there are certain people that I know have similar tastes in games than me that if I start if I see them back something, I immediately click through and I throw it in our show notes to talk about on Sunday. Otherwise, what usually happens is I see a bunch of people. I, I see the first email and I'm like a second, third, fourth. And then sometimes like when uh, the, the latest when Matt Coville launched his latest RPG one. My email was like ping, 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 ping. And it was like everyone I knew from G plus was back in this project. And I'm like, oh, I got to look at this. I'm like, oh, it's for 5e D&D. &D, I don't care. But it was a green flag. Like, OK, the number of people I trust backing this and I like their opinion of. I'm like, all right, this looks like it's worth a shot. Yep, absolutely. But you also have to know your friends, because, for instance, I have a friend who has a rather well paying job and loves role playing to the extent where they back a large number of 5e projects specifically. Yep. And I have a strong feeling that they are more forgiving of projects that aren't going to do well yeah. uh, because they have the income to be able to. So they are out there supporting the industry more than necessarily strongly evaluating the market. Uh, and getting. so know that you've got, know that some people are that way. And mm -hmm. to take those recommendations with a grain of salt. Now, I will also add that if it's my friend's project, not they're backing the project, but it's my friend's project, I'm going to be more likely to back just to support them. Even if I don't give, I don't care what I'm getting out of it. Yeah. I have backed projects that I have no interest. And to go with that, supporting a good cause. There is a massive RPG rule book back there that was 10 times thicker than I thought it would be that looks fascinating, but totally... I, you know what, I, I might give it a shot at some point, but it's really not my jam that I supported because it supported people who deserve to be supported. Yep. And and one of those things is, look, keep an eye out for Pledge Without a Reward stuff. If there mm -hmm. are a ton of people pledging without a reward, there's two possibilities. One, there's a huge backer kit on the back end where they're all just going to add up all the money later. Yep. And that's something we talked about earlier. But it's also just a sign of support. For instance, Garinto. I Garinto wasn't something that I was going to uh, play with my family. So I wasn't going to back it, but we love the project. So yeah. they got some of my money, even though, because I wanted to support the concept, uh, mm -hmm. despite the fact that me having a copy of Garinto was going to be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's not likely you were going to play. Yeah. That. So. All right, we've been at this for about an hour, so I think we've had enough time on this topic right now. Now, we will be jumping into the lobby. I do see lots more chat in the chat room, which I got to say, chat room has been awesome tonight. Thank you very much. And for those of you listening at home, you should have been here. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for our talk on what will and won't encourage us to back a tabletop crowdfunding project. Now, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to our website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or just hit us up on social media where I can be found as tabletopbellhop, one word. <laughs>